Meryl Broughton has always been fascinated by the human body. She's a GP in Albany, down on the southern tip of Western Australia. But Meryl's patients are not only of the living variety. For many years, she was the one called when an autopsy needed to be performed because someone had died suddenly or unexpectedly. Meryl has spent many hours down in the mortuary of her country hospital, closely examining hearts and brains and lungs and stomachs, piecing together the puzzle of what had caused a person to be lying on the metal trolley before her. And she's written a book about that experience called Autopsies for the Armchair Enthusiast. We are going to be talking about what happens to our bodies when we die. So if this is a subject that leaves you squeamish, maybe turn over to Classic FM for a bit. But we will be respectful. And it is just astonishing. So I do hope you can stay with us. Hi, Meryl. Hello. Are you surprised by other people's squeamishness around this subject uh, not at all, although I'm not one to be bothered about vomit and um, pee and poo. Um, lots of people are, and so it's a natural thing to feel apprehensive about. And the other thing, of course, with autopsies is um, the matter of death, and that does cause um, most of us a pain uh, of an emotional kind that uh, can't be get, gotten rid of. How would people react when you, when you told them that you performed autopsies as part of your work? Well, most people were intrigued because it is um, people instantly think of all oh, those television programs um, where autopsies play a big part in the investigation of a suspicious death. So to find out that I was looking into sudden deaths from natural causes did cause a lot of interest and raised eyebrows and some nervous laughs. <laughs> How was it that your, your younger sister first got you interested in dead bodies, Meryl? Uh, well, she was involved in a group that was fundraising for medical research into diseases of brain and spinal cord. And so we went on a tour of Pathology House, which was in fact a converted domestic dwelling. And the intriguing part about it was that there were whole brains suspended in buckets of formalin sitting in the laundry and in the kitchen on cafeteria trays with slices of brain. They were all set out ready to be examined, but it was a very interesting and intriguing experience. Where, where was this and, and when was this? Uh, well, this would have been uh, back in the early 70s, 1970s, um, in the back blocks of the main hospital. So that was uh, Royal Perth Hospital in and uh, at that stage, yes, it was just a, a house sitting in an empty block uh, long before they'd <laughs> built the extensions and uh, turned it into the rabbit warren that it is now. That really is horror movie material, the suburban well, it, block it's, full it's, of it's, brains suspended in fluid. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I had, in fact, completely forgotten about this episode um, until my sister brought it up at my 50th <laughs> birthday party. <laughs> and then I thought, ah, now that explains a lot. You can count on sisters to remember those stories. Absolutely. So once you began studying medicine, were anatomy classes the, the thing that fascinated you? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I was absolutely intrigued by the physicality of the bodies and the dissection process of looking at muscles, tendons and organs on the inside. And we spent a whole year uh, going through a single body as a, a team of um, medical students, and it was really one of the best parts of my medical training. Did your, your love of dissection and the study of tissues, histology, is that the term yeah, for the study correct. of tissues, did that yep. make you wonder if, if perhaps you weren't cut out for working with living patients? Yeah, it was, was more my encounters with living patients early on that put me off. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit sensitive, I think, to the sufferings of others. And so it was a bit of a trauma having to ask a head nurse, can I go and see the patient and examine them and discover their physical signs that medical students need to know. Um, and also that the patient will have had, you know, a half a dozen, a dozen medical students already ask them their same questions and examine the same parts. And so that's why possibly I started thinking there must be, uh, a, it would be nice to be in a field where I wasn't confronted with living patients quite so uh, graphically. As you began that 
training in anatomical pathology, Meryl. How did you go about encouraging doctors to um, to get you bodies? Yeah, um, I was quite enthusiastic about the process and part of this was because my first supervisor had been a coroner's pathologist and he was quite enthusiastic about the autopsy in comparison to looking at surgical pathology. And so I did go and sit with the um, junior doctors in the hospital I was working at and say, well, you can ask relatives for a, an autopsy because there's a lot more you can learn and, you know, we don't always have the full answers. Um, and that uh, did tend to increase the uh, the number of cases that came through. Where would you go and talk to them? Where would you hit them up with this suggestion? Well, in the hospital cafeteria, we'd often be um, snatching a break between the duties on the ward round or me down in the lab um, or in the post-mortem room. And yes, we'd sort of eat together. Um, and yeah, that sounds really awful. <laughs> so <actually. laughs> people start to avoid you. You know, there's Meryl again asking yeah. for us to, to hustle up and, and find us some corpses. Yeah. I mean, we're joking yeah. about it, but it, I guess it must be such a sensitive thing to have to ask a, a grieving partner or, or family to donate yeah. their loved one's body. What is the kindest way? To do it, yeah, I'm not sure that there is any easy way. Certainly, um, back then, it was the junior doctor who would be asking, and yes, uh, th- th- a lot of people didn't think, well, there, there's nothing more to know. We um, we know what caused this death, but there are other things that can be discovered. Um, it's it's a complicated thing, but certainly the rate of autopsies has fallen dramatically from being you know 45 percent down to about three or four percent um, these days I think part of the the reason why surviving family don't agree to an autopsy is it's a strange kind of and I know it's irrational but it's it's a concern about that loved one even though we understand that they're dead how do you make sense of that that strong urge that humans seem to have to care even for the remains of a loved one. Yeah, um, certainly there is an um, uncomfortable feeling about death and there is always emotional pain associated with death, even a good one. But we, we, we like to hold on to what's left and anything that remains is precious. Uh, and so that's part of the, the hesitancy about dealing with physical remains then it needs to be respectful, plus there's this tendency to want to hold on. Um, I had an interesting experience with this sort of wanting to hold on to something that you can't keep in that I have an interest in ephemera, which is the collection of you know bus tickets and programs and things like that. And my mother's mother had died um, when she was young and she was in fact not told that her mother was still alive. She was under the impression that her mother had died at her birth. Um, but when she was at a cousin's reunion and one of the cousins brought out an autograph book and in this autograph book was um, an autograph by my mother's mother and she stood there holding this autograph, looking at the written word and it was sort of such a tangible link to somebody who she'd always wanted to know and, you know, was not there anymore and yet here was something that you could hold on to. And that's when I became a um, paranoid collector of scribbled notes, you know, (laughs) dental appointment, one o'clock. I'd be saving this because I think, you know, this is a handwritten note. It's It's a tangible thing that you can feel of somebody who may not be here very long and dealing with sudden death made me acutely aware of that, you know, the person who's who's writing you're holding on a scrap of paper could well be gone tomorrow. Mm. Although you had this this strong interest in in the body and in dissection, for various reasons you ended up becoming a GP, how did you manage to return to your first love of post mortems? Yeah, it, it's a funny story about what general doctors do in, in the country. Um, having sort of dropped out of my uh, specialist training in pathology and gone into general practice, which was something that you could do back in the day, I'd moved across the country 
uh, uh, to to a regional area, and there we were at one of these doctors' dinners, which we had a lot more back in the day, um, and we had a little discussion around the table. Oh, what did you used to do before you came here? Oh, I used to do autopsies. Now that's a really funny thing to say at a dinner, but you know. I guess it just popped up in an opportune way and the doctor I was speaking to said, oh, that is fantastic because one of our doctors who's been doing autopsies for the coroner is about to retire and nobody had put their hand up to take over. So I did a bit of upskilling um, in the state mortuary to make sure that um, I was sort of up to date and then I took over from this retiring doctor to do autopsies for the coroner in the regional centre. What did your family make of this this new activity? Uh, well, they were raised eyebrows all around the dinner table again. Uh, yeah, they thought it was um, quite intriguing. Everybody did. Um, well, it was exciting and it was different and some country doctors deliver babies while I was at the other end of the spectrum doing the final investigation uh, between death and the grave. So, yes, it was a, a great source of interest. I didn't probably talk about the specific cases a lot with my family, but sometimes there were things that came up that you really couldn't keep to yourself. <laughs> what nickname did uh, they come up with for you? Well, yes, they did call me the cadaver carver for a while there, but uh, yeah, it, it, it is funny, but you know, um, if there is a place for these sorts of things. And yes, one of my colleagues, uh, when I said, oh, I'm going to write a book about doing the autopsies, and they said, oh, you could call it Stiff I Once Knew. Um, <laughs> Is it something, Meryl, that you, you can learn from books or is it like driving a car? You've actually, it actually comes through the doing. Yeah, it, it certainly does come through the doing. A, lo a lot of things that are practical and doing th that you have to physically do with your hands um, does require um, physically doing it. So even though you can look at the books and you can look at these lovely colour pictures and um, graphic descriptions, it's not until you're actually doing it yourself that you get a feel for uh, for how the tissues separate the dissection planes, the cleavage planes, the, the way to go through it. And, and certainly when you're dealing with a particular field, so I was mainly doing autopsies in sudden death from natural causes, um, you get a feel for the sorts of things that you're going to find and, and see. But it's not until you do it repeatedly that you get sort of the intuitive, instinctive aspects to it. What would you wear when doing post-mortems? Like a lot of emergency doctors do these days, we, we wore theatre pyjamas, I used to call them. So they were hawthorn green and they were a, a top and a bottom. Um, and they're hawthorn green because blood on green doesn't look red, it looks just darker green. Oh. So it's aesthetically more pleasing. Uh, but then, of course, we wore our plastic aprons that were white and blood looks normal colour on white. And what about on your feet? Uh, yeah, we, um, we, we wore gum boots or Wellington boots or whatever, wherever you are, whatever you call those things, yeah, that we would normally wear sloshing around in the wet because, yeah, it, it is messy, there's no doubt about it, and it's probably messier than normal surgery, uh, especially seeing as a lot of surgery these days is done through um, fibre optics and laparoscopes and things like that. So there's less cutting and therefore less mess. For a post-mortem, the first thing you need, of course, is a dead body. And mm. this might seem an odd question, but what makes you sure medically that someone has actually died? Yeah, this is an uh, interesting aspect. I used to laugh when I saw people on uh, television programs say, oh, you know, there they, they've passed away. And I think, how would they know? When you actually see someone die, it is like that. You can say, yep, they're definitely gone. They're not there anymore. And under certain conditions, yes, the signs of life can be hard to, to be sure that they're there or not. Do all those, those signs, the, the not breathing, the heart not beating, do they all happen at the same instant? They don't, um, and this is one of the things that's an issue for modern medicine is that brain death, it's important to be able to detect that even if the heart is still beating uh, because organ and tissue donation is such a, a, a valuable thing. Uh, but the parts of the body do have a um, different phase of stopping, I suppose. 
it's really only decomposition is something that can um, really tell you that the person or whatever it is has has died. But things like corneas, so the tissue uh, of the surface of the eye, can remain viable or living um, for a lot longer than a brain cell will. And whole organs can survive if they're properly nurtured or recovered. Well, once you once you have a body that you're certain is dead, you can yep. perform the autopsy. Why do you refer to the mortuary as the dungeon? Uh, yeah, well, in most facilities, it is on the ground floor or below ground floor, I suppose. Um, and I don't know whether this is just because it's a convenient way for vehicles to pull up and deliver and take away bodies you know, for appropriate burial. Uh, and, and yes, we always think of it the gloomy, dark place where you do unmentionable things, um, which is sort of true. Most of the autopsy rooms I've been in do have um, windows for natural light, which is um, very nice. I, I like natural light. It's not enough to examine tissues by, but it does make you feel like you're still in the land of the living, I suppose. <laughs> On TV shows, the, the bodies are kept in individual sliding drawers, sort of like a, a filing cabinet. Is that the case in real life? Um, well, it is in some situations, but it does vary from facility to facility. Um, one of the places that I was doing autopsies, they basically just had an empty room uh, where trolleys could be moved in and some of these trolleys can be multi-level so you can have many bodies in there at the same time so yeah it's a, it's a bit variable the the ones where you open the um, door and pull out a body on a sliding trolley um, is probably the most popular from an aesthetics and tv point of view um, rather than just wheeling somebody in from a little back room if we were to blindfold you and and put you in a mortuary meryl would you know straight away that that's where you were uh, not necessarily. Yes, the floor is hard and cold and, and there may or may not be odours. Um, certainly in between cases, you wouldn't know it from a bathroom, really. Oh, actually, bathrooms probably smell much sweeter. What can you tell me about the smells? Um, yeah, it, it's generally we um, there will be extractor fans and those sorts of things to try and make it um, not too awful. Um, it, it is one of those things some bodies will smell more than others because most bodies are stored um, refrigerated. Um, that does tend to damp off the smell and smell will be greater in a warmer environment than it is in a colder environment. Do you get used to those smells? Oh, I'm sure you do. And when you, um, just in general, when you walk into a room and there's a funny smell, if you stay in that room, um, even if the smell is still present, your, uh, your brain stops registering that it's there, which means that if you go out of the room and come back in, you will smell that smell again. So um, once you're, you're busy and involved with something, you wouldn't really notice um, unpleasant smells, uh, yes, you do need to have a nose so that you can smell unusual smells. So one case where the stomach was still full of alcoholic beverage, we could smell clearly that it was an alcoholic beverage. So yes, uh, those other smells are, are valuable. Who is the unsung hero of the autopsy room? Yeah, so the mortuary technician is, is the most important um, extra person that, that you would never see, well, you don't see very often in television programs. I mean, you, but in real life, uh, the mortuary technician is the support person, is the labourer for the pathologist who's doing the autopsy. So, uh, yeah, because they do all the, the heavy lifting parts and the wheeling the body in and out and a lot of the removal of organ blocks from inside the body plus the soaring and those sorts of things. So, yeah, they're all great because I'm a small person and so I really appreciate having a, a strong mortuary tech who can do all the, um, the heavy lifting parts. What made Paul, the, the technician you usually worked with, suited to the role? Yeah, um, so he was a hospital orderly and like most people in the country, um, multi-skilled, multitasking. Uh, and so he had been a, um ambulance volunteer and when he was attending cases, he thought, yes, I would really like to know a bit more about what's inside people. Um, and so he put his hand up to be a, a mortuary tech. 
yeah, that's how we sort of ended up in the same um, room in the bottom of the hospital. Um, him, uh, hospital orderly, me, GP, um, moonlighting in a very interesting and intriguing <laughs> field. Why do you think it's it's important for would-be technicians to be involved in autopsies as, as soon as they start their training? Uh, yeah, I mean, I did have an unfortunate experience when I was doing hospital autopsies. Somebody had applied for the job and they were just, they watched it from afar, uh, watched an autopsy from afar. And it is a gory procedure when you stand back and, and look from the doorway rather than up close and personal. So just like when somebody's giving birth, I mean, really, it, that's quite gory. There's a lot of messy fluids and there is blood. But if you're in a birthing suite, you're usually holding hands with the birthing mother um, or you might actually be the birthing mother um, and it's not gory. It's fabulous. There's something really exciting going on. Same thing with an autopsy. If you're right up close and personal, you're involved in looking at the organs and touching and feeling and examining that's the wonder and the excitement of it. If you stand back and look from afar, I mean, it's it's... Yeah, gory, horrible, and can really put a person off. So what's the first thing you do when encountering the dead body? What's the first step in an autopsy? So usually the mortuary tech is the one who's uh, removed any clothing and prepared the body so a body is naked on the stainless steel trolley. Um, so the, the first part is once you've read the documentation and the description about what had happened and how the person came to be there is an external examination. And this is a thorough thing from top to toe. And we check on, um, you know, eye colour and the diameter of the pupils and hair colour and how many teeth and what's missing and what's coming out the nose um, or that sort of thing, and tattoos and, and the physique of the body, all those sorts of things and scars, we, we look from top to toe. Once you're ready to take a look inside the body, what kind of incision do you make? This is a, a great contrast to modern surgery, which is having smaller and smaller incisions, uh, which allow um, quick recovery from surgery. Um, the autopsy incision is is the longest that it can be. So there's various different um, techniques. When we were doing them here, we just went from basically the Adam's apple straight down to the pubic bone. Um, and then, yes, the, the skin is carefully dissected and laid to each side. Then the mortuary tech would take off the rib cage. How? And then, well, they have to use a, a saw. Um, it's a oscillating saw, so it's a bit like the saw that's used to remove plaster of Paris from um, fractures in that it just um, vibrates quickly and that we use that to cut through the bone down the front of the armpits basically on each side so that the organs in the chest are fully revealed. Can that um, get, get messy, Meryl, using oh, a saw? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, well, just like the saw um, would make plaster little fragments when you're cutting through plaster, uh, yes, when you're cutting through own uh, fluids and, and bits of blood and tissue will fly around a bit. But it's not as messy as you might think. What's that moment like when the, the rib cage is peeled back and you have the internal organs exposed before you? Yes, well, I found that the most aesthetically pleasing moment of the autopsy because everything's just sitting there in a relaxed, natural way. You can see the lungs sort of framing around the heart and the, the, there's a lacy apron of fatty tissue lies over the intestines and it, it, everything's sort of peaceful and ordered and relaxed and at home. And that's just before, of course, we pull it all apart. What happens with blood after death? Is it still liquid? Yeah, so so blood does retain its normal um, is normally liquid after death. Although when there's an abnormality in the lining of the blood vessel, then that somehow triggers the separation process. So blood can clot and separate into the yellow liquid layer and the more solid sort of jelly-like clot. So that would more often happen in the arteries and particularly the large arteries. But um, the, the blood in veins usually stays liquid and when you cut through a vein, it'll just dribble out. Um, it won't pulse out because, of course, the heart's not um, operating anymore. So it's not quite as dramatic as when you cut into an artery during surgery. 
What other fluids do you collect? Um, we, we collect bile, which is from the gallbladder. Under the liver is the gallbladder. We use a needle to take some fluid there. And, um, and what is the bile potentially going to tell you? It's just another fluid that we can examine for the presence of drugs and toxins um, in general because the liver processes um, a lot of chemicals in the body the bile does tend to concentrate some things so that can be a useful place to detect smaller quantities perhaps of toxic substances. What, Meryl, is vitreous humour? Yeah, uh, vitreous humour is the jelly that's in the eyeball Um, and if you can't have uh, blood or bile or urine is another very useful substance to um, to test for toxins and, and drugs. Yeah, so um, we, we, we can extract the vitreous humour from the eyeball. Um, that's the thing that makes a lot of people cringe. And my, my editor said she put her hands <laughs> on the head and, <laughs> yes, and thought, oh, no, you know, brace yourself. listening to Conversations with Sarah Konoski. Find out more about the Conversations podcast. Just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. When you're doing an autopsy, Meryl, and it's time to get to the brain... Where do you make the incision? Yeah. Um, So um, we like to um, make people look presentable even after an autopsy. So the incision in the scalp starts behind one ear and goes right up over the top of the head and down to behind the other ear. The the incision is positioned just slightly back from centre so that when you're looking at someone from the front, um, you wouldn't even know there was an incision there. Uh, um, of course, we all think of Frankenstein and the way he put together his charming monster with an incision right across the forehead um, and a squared off sort of skull, which, of course, why Frankenstein's monster was a monster and we don't want to be like that. How do you handle the skull? So the the scalp can be peeled off the skull and it's it's one of those sort of surgical marvels that there's a cleavage plane and it just peels forward over the face and back off the back part of the skull quite easily and then of course the the skull has to be sawn the mortuary tech does put a little bit of a notch in the back part of the skull so that the top part of the um, skull will fit back in um, when we've finish doing the autopsy and not slip or move about. Once the the skull cap is removed, what do you see when you look into the head? Yeah, so this is another one of those beautiful moments of the autopsy where you look in and you see a lovely brain. The brains at autopsy are usually light grey, reflecting the grey matter which forms the outer layer of the brain. A living brain is pink um, because the fine mesh work of blood vessels has got flowing blood in it and so has this lovely rosy colour. But at autopsy, um, yes, the brain is, is grey. But it is, it's, I find it fascinating. I love the look of it. It is, the brain is soft, so you do need to handle it carefully and, and, and reverently. How do you get it out of the skull? So um, the the brain, of course, is connected to the rest of the body by the spinal cord and the various um, cranial nerves and blood vessels there. So, yes, you do need to carefully um, pull the frontal lobes up forward and then cut through all the various different connections um, so that then it will just sort of drop into your hands. What does it feel like? Yeah, so so the brain is, is soft. It's about the consistency of porridge or jelly. Certainly the... A membrane over the brain sort of holds it um, a little bit, but it's, it's it's like a hairnet. And so if you're not handling the brain carefully, it will splat. Um, if you dropped it, unlike the television ones where they're quite easy, they look quite firm and they drop them on a tray and it goes clunk, um, which, of course, a real brain would never go clunk. How, how do you keep it still then to examine it? 
Uh, well, it, it holds together a little bit, um, a bit like a, a jelly does when it's um, out of the jelly mould, um, but it doesn't have a lot of sort of vigour to it. So when you are slicing the brain to examine the, the interior structure, uh, you have to be quick and swift um, because the brain does tend to collapse as you cut th- cut through. And yes, when there is damage to the brain, like from a stroke, um, the white matter goes extremely soft and it's a bit like toothpaste. What can you learn then about someone's death by looking at their brain? What sort of things yeah. might you see? Yeah, so so you can see um, stroke, which will, will be this soft. The edges of it are usually a bit discoloured where there's been a bit of congestion. So there's little red flecks. Um, like splinters um, around the the soft area. Uh, Yes, when you're looking at the other parts of the brain, so you can see uh, this is where it should be dark and it's not. So that's a common situation with Parkinson's disease where the the part that's meant to be dark isn't dark. So you can say, ah, yes, that's consistent with Parkinson's disease. Um, A lot of pathologists these days, normal pathologists, will not be looking at the finer structures of the brain that's actually a a subspecialty of itself so sometimes yes that's when we would have to suspend the brain uh, in said bucket and uh, forward it off to a specialist. What happens to the brain after you finished with it in a post-mortem? Yeah, so um, once once I've examined the brain, then of course it's it's in pieces. Um, So we do need to contain it. So we usually put it into a plastic bag and return it to the skull. Yes, in a bygone era, we weren't quite so fussy and the brain would just go back with all the other organs into the main body cavity. But um, Really? Well, yeah, because, I mean, it doesn't matter where it goes. It's not doing so, what it did before. So why did you change? Why do you now put it back neatly in the skull? Um, I, I think it's aesthetics. There, there was a time where there was less respect paid to body parts. Um, people weren't as sensitive about um, mortal remains. There was a general belief in resurrection from the dead, so it didn't really you know, matter what your body was like. You were going to get a new body anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's just the aesthetics of people like the brain to be back in the brain case, the thought of going to a funeral and looking at your loved one and thinking, well, their brain is actually where their stomach is, is not on anymore. It's part of just the respect of of handling tissues after death. When you were doing autopsies, Meryl, how, how common was it for you to discover that the heart was the guilty party in someone's sudden death? So sudden death from natural causes, yeah, um, right up there, 75% of cases were due to cardiovascular, so that's usually uh, heart-related, and 50% would be due to coronary artery disease and the rest would be due to valvular heart disease or other related um, heart conditions. High blood pressure is another one that can carry you off quite suddenly. So, yeah, um, most of the hearts that I was examining in, in sudden natural death were abnormal in some way. So, what, what does an unhealthy or an abnormal heart look like? Yeah, um, so often they would have more fat on the outer surface than than would be good. Uh, most of the hearts that uh, are involved with a sudden death tend to be bigger, thicker than normal. So instead of the muscle layers being of the right size, they're much thicker. When they're thicker, it means that even good coronary arteries might not be good enough. So um, that's one of the things that, you know, we need to be sort of mindful of with coronary insufficiency. You could have no um, narrowings or hardenings of your arteries and yet still die from coronary insufficiency. So... Yeah, take your pills, people. Go for a walk. <laughs> Does the the heart feel like a a special organ to examine? You know, is it different than holding the liver or the intestines? Yeah, um, certainly. I I prefer hearts over those those other parts. It's a sort of a, a, an aesthetic thing too that the heart does tend to represent the core of the person, and uh, you know, a lot of the way we feel about things, we feel in our heart, whether we actually feel emotions in our heart. It's a bit sort of tricky um, because the brain is involved, but it's not just another piece of meat. Um, The heart is sort of the core of the person and certainly doing sudden death from natural causes was often the the place where most of the action was. But yes, it's, it's a 
beautiful thing. There's the different chambers and the valves that are inside and the, the valves have, you know, lovely curves and they're white and glistening and, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really lovely organ. As you say, those strong emotions register in the heart. You know, we, we see some of our heart beats faster or our heart hurts when we're yeah. in grief. Can the intensity of, of the way feelings occur in the heart actually be dangerous for us? Well, it can be. I mean, in in recent times, we've discovered the Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy. So that's the, the broken heart syndrome, um, where strong emotions can actually cause the heart muscle to cramp, for want of a better term. It sort of twists into the shape of a, a Japanese octopus pot, which is where the name comes from. Um, and Yes, if you survive that, your chances are really good because there's nothing intrinsically wrong with your heart. But if the squeezing, the twisting um, procedure goes on for too long, it can um, substantially damage your heart and cause the electrical sort of malfunction that can lead to sudden death. Uh, and one of the cases that I saw probably did have um, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, but it was only about three years after the thing had been first described in the medical literature, so I did not attribute it to its probable real cause. How early does the heart form and start to beat in a human embryo? This is one of the, the first, well, it is the first organ that develops in, in the mammalian embryo um, that you can, under the microscope, see red blood cells and um, it sort of groups together the blood vessels, the heart and the blood cells all sort of develop simultaneously. And 21 days after conception, uh, that's when the heart is already beating um, and it the, the heart has developed before there is a brain. I mean, it's it's one of the first things that you need is the circulating blood for other tissues to um, to then grow from. You then move on to the, the less romantic or poetic parts of the body, the abdominal organs. Where do you examine those, Meryl? Yeah, so all the organs are removed from the, the body during autopsy so that we can examine them more closely. So the organs from the thorax sort of come out in one big block and then each part is, is removed um, from its connecting parts. So the heart and the lungs sort of are connected together. Yes, the diaphragm sort of separates the thorax from the abdomen and the organs there are brought out separately. Um, with the intestines, usually uh, I would be running them. Um, they've been removed from the body, but they remain on the tray. And we only go sort of into the inside of certain parts if there is um, indications that we need to do so. So certainly we look inside the stomach and you can see some really interesting things about what people have eaten and yes then run the run the bowel through like a like a sausage machine I suppose from one end to the other. I'm guessing um, that's where the smells get the strongest when yeah. you're at this stage of the autopsy yeah. is that right? It, that's right um, because what's in the especially what's in the large bowel is you know what you would see in the toilet so it's got a similar sort of smell too um, so that's one reason I suppose we don't open it unless we really need to. The gallbladder is is one of the organs that you examine. It's a mysterious little thing, the gallbladder. Can you describe it for me? What what does it look like? So the gallbladder is sort of the, the size and shape of a hen's egg, um, except that it's soft rather than having a hard shell. And yes, it's got a lovely velvety lining, which is about the same colour of the bile that's in there. And bile can vary in colour from you know, being like used motor oil, thick and black, to being like golden syrup and it's not nearly so tasty and yeah <laughs> and what actually else? i can't i can't say that i've ever tasted <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah, you might do if you were vomiting yeah that's a sort of a similar thing yeah and what else might you find in the gallbladder besides this, this yeah so uh, yeah gall, gallstones of course are the, are the things that are not meant to be there but uh, many people develop them and they can vary in colour, of course, depending on what they're made of. Really? Well, um, what, what are the different colours? So uh, a common one would be uh, what we call cholesterol stones that are like little pebbles. Um, they're, they're faceted, um, they're bright yellow 
and usually there's quite a few of them. Um, so that's cholesterol stones. Then there's pigment stones that tend to be darker, so they can be sort of black or they can be green and usually made of the same pigments that are in red cell breakdown. So similar to a bruise, which can go through various different shades as it develops, gallstones that are made of uh, pigment can, can be various colours as well and sizes from little tiny spiky ones to marbles and things like that. The bodies that you were performing autopsies on are usually refrigerated. You know, if a person dies in the hospital, their bodies are taken straight to a refrigerated morgue. What does that mean for dissection? Does that have an effect on the way the, the organs and the skin appear to you? It does tend to make fatty tissue more solid. So at body temperature, fatty tissue is actually liquid. So that's why you can Um, poke a person and they go squishy when you poke them Um, but once a person's been refrigerated for several hours then it does tend to make it a bit stiffer it's the same sort of thing with butter if you leave butter out at room temperature it'll be malleable you can spread it Um, whereas if you leave it in the fridge sometimes it's too hard Um, now fatty tissue won't ever get as hard as butter but yeah it's certainly much stiffer if, uh, if, if someone's died at home and it's been a few days before they have been found, what happens to their skin? How, how, are the, how is the surface of the skin starting to change? The skin does t- start to separate so that, yeah, the, the surface layer can sort of um, blister off the underlying layer and so that's when you get these bizarre effects of the hair sliding off or the... Um, you know, the hand surface skin coming off like a glove and underneath it's pink and slimy Um, and even the forensic textbooks call it that. So, um, And that can make things really awful and difficult to work out. Was this person injured or or that? Because it's all a bit messy and soft and mushy. Once you had identified, when you could identify an obvious cause of death, would you pull up stumps? Like, does that end the autopsy? Uh, not at all, because really you need all the information to to know. Um, so even though you might find, uh, look, the coronary arteries are terrible, they're narrowed down to 80 or 90%. That can certainly be a cause of death. But if you open their skull and then find they've got a brain hemorrhage, then yes, a brain hemorrhage is more likely to be the cause of death than the dodgy coronary arteries. So if you just looked in one spot first, then you might not get all the information. Similarly, we turned up a few cases where the person had had a a blood clot to the lungs which had killed them. But why did they get a blood clot? Um, In one case, there was an unrecognised bowel cancer that had spread to the liver and the presence of cancer does increase your clotting Mm. tendencies and can result in a a blood clot. So, yes, they died of a pulmonary embolus, but really the cause of pulmonary embolus had been their bowel cancer. How long would it usually take you to perform an autopsy? Um, So usually it would be at least two hours. If if there was um, a lot of dissection involved, which sometimes would occur if somebody had had already had coronary artery bypass surgery, um, then unpicking those coronary arteries that had been surgically put in would, would take a bit longer. So sometimes it might be two and a half, three hours. Um, then there would be the report writing, which um, does have to be thorough enough, um, certainly for another doctor to be able to understand and see everything that was found. So that would take a, a few more hours. And while you were in the, the room together with that deceased person, would you and Paul the, the mortuary tech chat to one another or, or what was the atmosphere like? Um, yeah, so, so we would talk about things. Certainly we would talk um, initially when we're looking at the external examination. But would you find yourself, I don't know, chatting about what your plans were for the weekend or yeah. what had happened yeah. in the football? Like, did it become routine at a certain point, what you were um, doing? Yes and, yes and no. Um, I think on the whole, we were more interested in what we were doing, what we were finding. And so often it would be uh, if Paul found something, oh, look, come, there's this thing stuck in the throat. Um, or I'd be saying, oh, look at this coronary artery. He'd come over and have a look. Um, so we were more interested in you know, what we were finding um, rather than, well, we did talk that he went roo shooting on the weekend and 
things like that, but not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> As you, you and he were doing all of this meticulous medical work, are you thinking about the body before you as a person? Um, not really. Yes, before we start the autopsy, we um, look at the documents and read about the, you know, what had happened, how the body came to be discovered and things like that. But the person is not really there as a person. Um, it's just their mortal remains. So it's a bit like going through somebody's wardrobe that you sort of, you're looking at what's left behind. You can deduce a lot about their, um, them from what's there, but the real person is not there. Maybe it was helpful not to have a sense of their personhood there. That might have stood in the way of you doing the job you had to do. That's right. Um, so we were doing a job. Um, we had a, a mystery to solve, a, a puzzle to sort out, and it was more clinical and at arm's length as far as emotions are concerned. And you can be adversely influenced by emotions. So um, it can colour what you see or what you think you see. So keeping the emotions out of the actual procedure is what was necessary. It's reflection later that you can um, sort of uh, think about these things. Uh, and yes, there was a certain amount of like, there's data collection, but then you do have to fit the pieces together to see if you can work out what had happened, what was the sequence of events, what part did each abnormality play in in contributing to the death. You were working always as a as a GP at the same time, Meryl, so you might then go back to your living patients in your clinic after after doing a post mortem. Would you yeah. look at those living patients differently? Um, well one of the good parts was when they were lying there and I was having a feel of their tummy and, and feeling, oh can I feel their gallbladder? Can I feel their liver? Because I've just come from looking at actual livers and gallbladders, I could picture what was under the surface much more easily and knowing a lot more about sort of anatomy and the way the body sort of works, it was easier then to sort of piece together, well, I think this is what the cause of your problem is. Yes, it's something to worry about or no, it isn't. But I did become more paranoid about people looking after their health because I was seeing people who had died suddenly, they had high blood pressure or they didn't know they had cholesterol problems, that it made me more keen to help people look after their health so that they wouldn't have a sudden unexpected death. The hospital where you performed autopsies with Paul was, was old and run down. What did you discover about the new hospital that was planning to be built? Yeah, so so we had the advantage um, locally of a nice sort of plot of land next to where the old hospital was. So we could um, demolish the old nurse's home and build a new hospital while the old one was still in existence. And the developers did call different groups together so that we could put in our wish list, what do we want in our uh, new hospital? And so I was a member of the Mortuary Users Group, uh, which is uh, really Mug. quite bizarre sort acronym. of thing. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was just thinking, oh, I wonder how that will sound on my CV, <laughs> member of the Mortuary Users Group. Um, and the new plans did not have an autopsy room, and we remarked upon this, and the developer was quite surprised, what, you're doing autopsies in a regional hospital? It was unusual. In fact, I was the only one doing autopsies outside of the state mortuary at the time. Uh, yeah, so um, she went off to look into it, and when they came back, you know, no, we weren't going to. They weren't going to put a autopsy room in the new hospital, partly because routine hospital autopsies uh, aren't done in regional hospitals. It, it's a sort of a leftover from a bygone era when when these things were done more often, and when generalist doctors like me. Um, being able to do autopsies was more common. Um, now, because general practice is a specialty of its own um, and there's lots of training involved, you don't have anatomical pathologist dropouts um, <laughs> pop popping in to be able to do an autopsy to a sufficient standard. Uh, so, yes, they were, were not um, going to put an autopsy room. And because I was the only one who was doing it, yeah, 
uh, they figured it, it was a, a thing that they couldn't really afford to put in the hospital. So where are the autopsies done now for sudden and, and unexpected deaths in yes, your part of WA? Yeah, so so they're all transferred to the state mortuary in the capital city. So um, this is not uncommon and probably a lot more common now than it used to be because you need people with the right skill set to do the job. But even if somebody has the skill set, you can't do it anymore. There isn't an autopsy room in the regional hospital. So it really was the, the end of an era or you were at the end of a line for, for a particular kind of uh, autopsy. What did... Paul, your old colleague, bring you as a present to mark the end of your working relationship? Yeah, so he brought me a brain cactus in a skull pot. So, uh, <laughs> And I'm sure you can still buy these at, at, at nurseries. But it, it was a delight because, yes, we had enjoyed our time together in, in doing these, uh, these autopsies for the coroner. And, yes, it was a, another sort of light aspect of, yes, we did something serious, we did something worthwhile, uh, but we certainly had fun. Do you still have that cactus now? Well, I have the cactus pot. Unfortunately, the cactus grew very exuberantly and, and uh, really overflowed, and then suddenly it just turned up its toes and experienced a sudden unexpected death, <laughs> I think. What, um, what do you hope happens to your body after death, Meryl? Having spent so many years up close to dead bodies, what do you hope ends up with yours? Uh, I don't mind, really. Um, once I'm finished with it, Whatever's done with it is is okay by me. It's it's a job for the um, people who are left behind to decide what's the most appropriate thing. Uh, it would be nice to think, yes, if I've got good tissues and organs that they could be used um, for the benefit of others. Um, sometimes that's a challenge in the regional centres. They could certainly use corneas, but using a, um, a heart is going to be a, a difficult thing from the, the country's perspective. But yes, once I'm finished with my body, um, it's up to you guys. You can do what you like with it. Well, let's hope it's, it's a long way off. Meryl, thank you for taking us into the extraordinary world of, of autopsies. Thank you for being my guest on Conversations. It's been my pleasure. Dr Meryl Broughton was my guest on Conversations. Meryl's book is Autopsies for the Armchair Enthusiast. I'm Sarah Konoski. Thanks for listening. For more like this, hit subscribe or check out the ABC Listen app for podcasts ad-free. 